Buildings are a fundamental need of humans. They protect us. They give us structure. They allow us to do the things that we do. They make us more productive. They hold our hospitals. They hold our schools. This is where we learn. From the 10th century BC, when the first building's structures were built, through today, man has continued to evolve, society has continued to evolve, and the buildings have continued to evolve. From the first stone cutters to data center integrators, we have continued to improve as we've gone along. One of the other things that we've done with our buildings, they become tools, largest manufacturing plants. And as productivity has increased in these, product, in these manufacturing plants over the years, inevitably the comparison to construction has, has occurred. Several years ago, there was a comparison of the airplane industry to construction. The thought was a Boeing 777 is built at 1,000 square feet per day. What would it take to build at 1,000 square feet per day? Imagine taking your building, the last one that you did or the next one that you're going to do, and divide it by 1,000. And that's how many shifts you get to build it. At the same time, I happen to be leading a, a project, 397,000 square feet, where the owner asked us to take 169 days out of the schedule. The opportunity for us was we were going to have to build at 1,000 square feet per day. When the shock wore off, the questions came up. How many cranes can you put on that site? Can you do 24-7? What's it going to take? Anybody who's built before understands, we'll just do more overtime. We're going to do whatever we have to do to get it done. But the owner didn't want to pay anymore and gave us the opportunity to go back and look at it differently. To quote the famous industrial engineer, Alan Mogensen, we needed to work smarter, not harder. The opportunity for us is we were at the right place in time. We were going to look at construction, take the best from today, and also learn from the past. Since we're one of the largest industries in the world and one of the longest running ones, with some companies being over 1,400 years old, there was a huge opportunity for us to learn. We had to double productivity. We were going to look and leverage the best that we have today, BIM, big data, computers. And we were also going to learn from the past. We were going to go back to the turn of the century, where they really understood motion economy, process charts, and work design. So to get going, we started with BIM. And the idea was we were going to model everything, even the paint. We modeled the utilities. We modeled the underground. We modeled all the structures. The interesting thing that happened with this was everybody was working within the models. Reality was the same as virtual reality. The coordinates aligned everything. It was all coordinate based. And soon we started to realize that it was a community model. Humans interacting with design inside the virtual reality of the model. Designers, builders, detailers. The designers th doing their best work thinking about the end users and the builders thinking about how do we put these structures together. So often we think about design intent. But in this world, it became design understanding. How often is it like the telephone game? where we start over here, and by the time it gets over here, it's totally different. We needed perfection at the connection, perfect information and material at that point of attachment, that production line approach. When you think about an assembly line, all the material is right there. It's one starting with one piece, the chassis Ford did. Stacking on, going to the next one, going to the next one. But, that, but the beauty of what Ford had done was the workers had stopped moving and the work moved past them. We started to realize that we were on a production line also. But our production line was, was a little bit different. But when we really started to look, we saw exactly where it was at. 
A building is a production line, but the production line is stationary and the workers move past the point of attachment. As the quality of the design moved, as the quality of the model increased, our productivity increased. Things were getting tighter and tighter. New terms were coming out. We weren't plumbing steel anymore. We were positioning it. We were matching the information. Our total stations were bringing coordinates from the, mo from the model into the field and from the field back into the model. A new phrase came out, built to design. When you think about it, how often we as built everything, and we don't always believe in the as builts. Imagine a job where the model matched the field. With higher quality, we got higher productivity. The bottom line, productivity doubled. In some months, it tripled off of what was standard. We put 1,800 pieces of steel up in 100 hours. We attained 1,067 square feet per shift. And the best metric, it was the, the job that everybody thought was just going to be grueling, was the best job that they'd ever been on. Everybody asked the question, why can't we be on these all the time? And what do we got to do to get to the next? Well, we saw that we could still improve. We had all this data. We'd been doing a lot with the modeling. But the important part about BIM is the eye. We had more information that we could get out of it. We, we again thought about this supply chain. We thought about the material, but there's the information. Think about it. TV dinner. The directions are on every TV dinner that comes to your house. But where are the directions? Where are the information on all the material that comes to our job site all the time? Back to that production line, that production line worker in the manufacturing plant, they have all perfect information. They have all the knowledge that they need, along with the skill and the material to put it in. But we were finding that 50% of our RFIs had questions as to where does it go? We had to improve that. With that, all that data, we started to also realize what we called 20i. In many, time, many cases, the data for any object on a job can be used 20 times, from design all the way through maintenance. In the past, it was all siloed. But today, we can pass that information down the line, conserve that information, and, and make sure that everybody has what they, what they need. Again, produ productivity increased. We had to capture all this data. We started using barcodes and QR codes, pulling the data in, moving the data back out, noticing that room schedules were tied to finish schedules, electrical schedules and mechanical schedules, giving perfect information to all kinds of people. Can you imagine? You weren't the one who checked your submittals, but you could scan material out on the site to make sure that it was the right material that was on the job. The other thing that got to be interesting about it was we started noticing certain things. Fireproofing, not always the most sexy thing in the world, to a mother, except to a mother of a fireproofer. But it is something that invariably that you have to get done. We soon found, not that we thought, that having an electric pumps is the most important thing to shooting 750 bags a day for fireproofing. We learned all kinds of new things with this data. And we started recycling the data and using it on other jobs. On average, we were finding on major projects 7,000 deliveries for $50 million worth of material coming to the job site. We started noticing that in certain cases, critical path wasn't as important as how fast you can get things unloaded. As we continued to move on, we were looking for the next thing. We started to research, in, research even more manufacturing. And we found an interesting thing. It took us back to the turn of the century. It, turned, it took us back to a gentleman named Frank Bunker Gilbreth, a brick mason. We all thought it was about cars. We thought it was about manufacturing. But we came to find out that this man, in the late 1800s, as an apprentice brick mason, was taught his first day on the job how to lay bricks. And on the second day, he was put with another journeyman who taught him this is the way to lay bricks. 
And his brilliance was to ask the question, why for something that's been done 6,000 years, there's not one best way? And that was the quest that he had. How do we improve motion? And the key with them, with he and what his wife did, was amazing. It was the next part of us. Was his mantra was, if motion isn't valued, it cannot be improved. Well, for us on the job site, it, we started looking at everything differently. The idea is, is not to move faster, which we've been taught for years. It's to remove the wasted motion. We started thinking about, well, how fast do we walk? We all walk at 240 feet per minute. Well, how many times do we, the way we set our jobs up, do we have things that were farther than 120 feet away? This moved us into what we would later call work design, and we learned from him also pro process charting. We started charting everything. Think about it. Every object that's the same has the same process chart to install it. They made detailed charts back in the early 1900s. We started making detailed charts in 2010. Following those, we started, we were able to recycle that information. Again, back to this idea of a pattern recognition, instead of looking at every job as different, we started looking at every job as the same. We started recycling and improving jobs. Again, quality went up, productivity continued to go up, and we were getting closer and closer to that idea of assembly line approach to construction. The final part was to sync and to understand that our modern manufacturing and construction sites are not just the site, but global. You know, when you think about it, BMW just assembles the cars and parts. When we went back to the idea of the of Boeing building that plane at 7,000, at 1,000 square feet per day, there, that's final assembly. We focus a lot of times about our job site and just the site, but we have manufacturing plants all over the world, and we're trying to synchronize parts and pieces that are coming there. We started looking at what do we do the same? Our trucking, every, almost all our material comes to the job site via truck. Might come ship, but its final point is, is truck. How do we synchronize those trucks with our cranes to our installation? When you think about it in a car manufacturing plant, chair, seats for cars, in a lot of cases, come 15 minutes before they're installed. We couldn't get to that, but we could try to synchronize everything. And we did that with steel. Prior to the steel coming up, we synchronized the, the plan for the cranes and the hoisting, the trucks down to 15 minute increments, and we were able to do it with trucks that were coming as far away as California. The bottom line, in one month, we erected, in downtown Seattle, we erected 3,000 pieces of steel. We had 300 major deliveries along a 300 foot section of road, poured two decks, and fireproof two floors. Four months later, 12 stories were complete. The concrete was poured, fireproofing was done, skin was on, and roof was on. We feel like we've just scratched the surface, but we can continue, and we can continue to improve. But we've got a great history of industry with what we do in construction. And we feel like that this is a, a great opportunity to, to continue to push the outside of the envelope with new technologies, but also leverage what we have learned in the past to mesh those two together to continue to increase our productivity. Thank you.